I've had you turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. I do promise that I'll be shorter than normal. I don't guarantee anything, but I, it'll be shorter than normal. We're looking at um, <clears throat> Paul continuing to defend his apostolic ministry. The, in, in this church, there was a, a minority group we'll call them a rebellious minority, that rejected Paul's authority. They didn't think that Paul was a real apostle, so they didn't receive his ministry, which meant that the church wasn't growing as much as it could grow spiritually because they rejected Paul. And so Paul, because of his love for them and his care and concern for their spiritual growth, defended his ministry not for a personal reason, not because he was personally hurt by this, but it was for their good, it was for the love of God in their life that he did this. So we're gonna read through and, and study the first 15 verses of chapter 11, 2 Corinthians. And we're gonna see a few things here. We're gonna see Paul's fear for this group of people, his fear for the Corinthian church because they were being deceived by false teachers. We're also gonna see why Paul did not demand that he receive a speaker's fee for appearing there and for, for preaching. The false teachers did demand fees. They didn't minister for free. Oh, no. They were, they were demanding large sums to do what they did. And then the last thing in, in quite a lot of this is we're going to get an insight into the character and nature of Satan um, and his false teachers, which Paul calls his ministers. So, look with me in verse 1. Oh, that you would bear with me in a little folly, and indeed you do bear with me. For I am jealous for you with godly jealousy. For I have betrothed you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. <clears throat> but I fear, lest somehow, as the sea as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he who comes preaches another Jesus whom we have not preached, or if you receive a different spirit which you have not received, or a different gospel which you have not accepted, you may well put up with it. Now, there is good jealousy and there is bad jealousy. Bad jealousy would be what we've referred to as the 10th commandment, the covetousness. So we're jealous for what other people have. We don't want them to have it. We want it for ourselves. That's covetousness, that's jealousy, and that's bad. It's forbidden. There is good jealousy, though, and that would be in love, you are jealous for the affection of the person that you love. God was jealous for the affections of Israel. In the Old Testament, we read through the, the minor prophets and we see how they were cheating on God with false gods. God was jealous for their love and affection. We also see here Paul talking about the Corinthians. He was jealous for them because he had espoused them to Christ. In other words, he introduced them to their groom, Jesus Christ. He wanted them to love Jesus Christ with all their mind, heart, soul, and strength. And if they were deceived by these false teachers, they were drawn away from that first love. And so he was jealous for that. If you're a husband here, you understand this, that you're jealous for the, affection, the affections of your wife. Wives, you know this for your husband. Um, several years ago, when we lived up north, um, we were going through a really rocky patch in our marriage I was being very difficult with Lisa, and she came back from the gym, and she told me that there was a guy, that one of these trainers in the gym, who said to her, you look good today, and, and she heard it, you know, and she told me this, and I understood what I had been doing to her, and you know what? It caused me to be jealous, and it caused me to get on my face and get my, my life right with God and to start treating her better. That's good jealousy, you see, when you love someone and you want them to love you back. And so there's a good jealousy and a bad jealousy. Now, 
Did you notice what it says in verse 3? But I, fear lest, <clears throat> but I fear lest somehow, as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Now when it talks about simplicity there, he's talking about having a single mind toward Jesus. Just keeping the focus, pure devotion, pure love toward Jesus. I don't want your minds to be distracted from that pure love relationship that you've got with Jesus Christ. He says, just in the same way that the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness. Now you know that back in Genesis chapter three, in fact, would you turn with me back there, right back to the beginning of the Bible. Genesis three, I want you to see these in black and white. The serpent deceived Eve by craftiness. Up to this point in the creation, Adam and Eve have a perfect relationship with God. They walked with God in the garden. They had this intimacy with him. But then comes to, on the scene Satan in the form of a serpent. And by the way, in the form of a beautiful serpent. It wasn't like this kind of snake thing that we think of today like, I hate snakes be honest I can't stand him and but the serpent was shining and, and beautiful and before the fall this was something glorious now look now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made and he said to the woman has God indeed said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden and the woman said to the serpent oh we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden but of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that in the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Now, I want you to notice how Satan deceived Eve. Number one, he came and cast doubt on the word of God. Look what he says at the end of verse, uh, verse one. Has God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Well, look back with me at verse 15 of chapter two of Genesis. Look what it says. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. The Lord God commanded the man saying, of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you will surely die. Did you notice? God's command was in the positive. You can eat of any tree of this garden but one. Satan turns it around and makes it a negative and casts doubt on it. He says. Did God say that you can't eat of every tree of the garden? You see? He started to cast out. That was the first way he started to deceive Eve. The second way, look what he did. And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said you shall not eat of it, nor shall you touch it lest you die. Now God didn't say you can't touch it. She added that, that wasn't right. And maybe Adam had said, hey, don't even touch that thing. Don't even touch that tree. But she added to the word of God. It's not good to add to or take away from God's word. But then look, verse four. Then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. Now he denies the word of God. First he casts doubt on it. Then he denies it full stop. You'll, you won't die when God said, yes, you will die. The day that you eat of it, you will die. Now, what's your attention here? I know there's a lot going on over there. Never mind. <laughs> you know, those kids. In fact, I'm going to close that door. Hold on. Just Hi. Good to see you again. <laughs> there we go. That's better. Okay. Eyes on me, please. Ears on, ears on my words and on the word of God. So, um... 
So he cast doubt, and then he denies the word, and then check this out. Then he attacks the very character of God. Verse 5 says, For God knows that in the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Hey, God's holding back on you. God knows that this is good for you, but he doesn't want you to have the best. These are the ways that Satan deceived Eve, and he still comes to us with these same temptations to this very day. And so Paul, back in 2 Corinthians 11, says, I don't want you to be corrupted. I don't want your minds to be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ in the same way that Satan deceived Eve by his craftiness. How how does he do this to the Corinthians? Well, look in verse 4. For if he who comes preaches another Jesus, whom you have not preached, or if you receive a different spirit which you have not received, or a different gospel which you have not accepted, you may well put up with it. Now, Paul didn't want them cheating on Jesus with a false god or a false teacher. He says, these teachers come in and they preach another Jesus. Do you know that all false teachers have a different Jesus? All cults have a different Jesus. Now, they may use the same word, but the meaning they're pouring into that word is different. So, the background here is, you had Judaizers, which were Jewish people, that came in and said, well, you can't just receive Christ, you've got to be circumcised and keep the law of Moses and believe in Jesus in order to be saved. Paul says, no way. It's by faith alone in Jesus Christ that we're saved. What he did for us on the cross and by his resurrection, that saves us. You believe in it, receive it, you're saved. That's a great gospel message. That's good news. There were also groups called the Gnostics. Now, the Gnostics believed that the spiritual world was all good and the material world was all bad. And that this spiritual world there was a God that created a lesser God that created a lesser God and a lesser God all the way down to Jesus. And that Jesus was not God in human flesh. So the Gnostics denied the incarnation, that Jesus was both God and man in one person. 100% God, 100% man. They denied that. This is another Jesus. And as I said, all cults have another Jesus. You've got today Jehovah's Witnesses. Jehovah's Witnesses believe that Jesus was Michael the Archangel, the first created being of God, and he is not Jehovah God. You've got the Muslims. The Muslims believe that Jesus Christ was a prophet inferior to Muhammad. He was not God and did not die on the cross. He was substituted by someone else they think was maybe Judas, who died on the cross in place of Jesus Christ. You have the Mormons who believe that Jesus was the spirit brother of Lucifer. He was conceived by a sexual union between Adam God, their Elohim, and Mary. You've got Christian science who believe that Jesus is the human man, but Christ is the divine idea, whatever that means. I don't really know. You've got the Hindus who believe that Jesus was one of 330 million incarnations of Brahman, who was their impersonal pantheistic deity. And then you've got the Buddhists who believe that Jesus was an enlightened man, not God in the flesh. So there are lots of other Jesuses around. You've got a different spirit that they come and preach. Now, this is not the spirit of faith. Look back with me in chapter 4, verse 3. Sorry, that's 1 Corinthians 4, 3, I think. No, it's not even that. It's somewhere in the Bible. <laughs> he talks about, he hasn't, he's given us the spirit of faith. Now, The Judaizers wanted to bring the people into bondage, right? Um, And so it's 
not about freedom in Christ, but it's about bondage under the law. And Paul said to Timothy in 2 Timothy 1.7, God hasn't given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. He didn't bring us under bondage. He came to set us free to live as he has made us to live. We're made in his image. When we become Christians, we're set free from the bondage of our past. So they come, these Judaizers, these Gnostics, and they come and bring people into bondage, a different spirit. But also, he says, or a different gospel, which you have not accepted. This is the gospel, not of grace, but of works. Grace is the difference between Christianity and every other religion. Because every other religion teaches that you've got to earn your salvation or earn some place with God. But Christianity says it's all by grace. It's all a gift that you just receive by faith. And it's so wonderful. That is good news. That sets people free. So Paul says in Galatians 1.8, look, if anybody comes to you, even if an angel from heaven comes to you and gives you any other gospel than what we preached, let him be accursed. And the word that he used there was anathema, which means cursed to the lowest hell. So you think, man, Paul, tell us what you really think. He was so serious about the true gospel that he says, if anybody preaches to you a different gospel, let him be cursed to hell. Because it's the true gospel that sets us free. He says, if these guys come in and tell you this gospel and give you another Jesus and give you a different spirit, he says, you may well put up with it. That was his fear. He didn't want them to be ripped off. He didn't want them to, be, to cheat on Jesus. We'll look in verse five. For I consider that I am not at all inferior to the most eminent apostles. Even though I am untrained in speech, yet I am not in knowledge. But we have been thoroughly manifested among you in all things. Now when he talks about not being inferior to the most eminent apostles, literally the word in Greek is super apostles. Paul is using sarcasm here. He calls these false teachers the super apostles. These guys come flowing into Corinth and they demand to be paid and they want a, a large audience and they are ripping people off and they're boasting about what they've done and who they are. These super apostles, wow. He says, I'm not inferior to them. You think that I'm inferior to them because of my ministry to you? He says, I'm not inferior to them in any such way. He says, even though I'm untrained in speech, yet I am not in knowledge. Now, I think Paul was a tremendous speaker. When I read through his sermons, like in Acts chapter 17 in Athens, and in Acts 26 when he was recounting his conversion before King Agrippa, I'm blown away by the power of his speaking. He was a great preacher in my opinion. So what does he mean here when he says, I'm untrained in speech? What could be that he was untrained in Greek rhetoric. You see, Aristotle taught about rhetoric, and rhetoric was basically an art of persuasive communication, moving people to action or to change their opinion in some way. And rhetoric was highly esteemed in Greek culture and then on into Roman culture. And so you, you see in Athens, when Paul went there, he said, they went up to Mars Hill and the philosophers, all they did was talk about the latest and greatest philosophy and they're, they're talking back and forth. This was highly esteemed in Greek and Roman culture. Paul was not trained in rhetoric, but Paul was a great speaker. But notice, when Paul came to Corinth, it tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, he said this, I didn't even use great speech when I came to you. In fact, I wanted to make it so simple that you couldn't rely on how powerful a speaker I was. I wanted to make it so dead simple, the gospel message, that you couldn't go, 
Wow, did you hear how well he spoke? No, I wanted you to believe in the message itself. And so look what he says. He said, For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness and fear and much trembling, and my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in a demonstration of the spirit and power that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Guys, there is such tremendous power in the simple message of the gospel. You know, when you go into your workplace or your school or your friends, with your friends, and you're meeting with them and you share with them this simple message that Jesus Christ died on the cross for their sins, was buried and rose again the third day. And if you put your faith and trust in him, he'll forgive you of everything that you've ever done, past, present, or future. And you can go to heaven and not go to hell. Oh my goodness, there is power in that message. To change a life from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to the power of God, from hell to heaven, there is power in that message. Paul says, I want you to focus on the message, not the messenger. That's why I kept it simple. So he says, I was untrained in speech, but did you notice? He says, yet I am not in knowledge. <laughs> Paul was a very smart man. No dummy. Paul was born in Tarsus of Cilicia. Tarsus was one of the greatest learning centers of the Roman world. It outranked Alexandria and Athens. It was a university city. Paul was born there. He probably went to primary school there. Then Paul went to Jerusalem to study under the feet of Gamaliel in the, the school of Gamaliel. Gamaliel was the greatest Jewish rabbi of his day. And Paul went to study there. And Paul, according to Galatians chapter 1, verse 14, graduated at the top of his class. He excelled more than any of his contemporaries in that school. Paul was a wise man. He was a Pharisee. He knew the, Greek, he knew the, the, the Jewish customs. He knew the Jewish law like the back of his hand. He was wise. In fact, when Paul would preach in that sermon in Athens, he could just... Off the top of his head, he could quote um, Greek poets, you know? When he, when he wrote to uh, Titus, Titus chapter one, he quoted a Greek poet. The guy was intelligent. So he says, you know, I'm untrained in rhetoric perhaps, but not in knowledge. But you know what the greatest schooling Paul ever got was? It wasn't in uh, Gamaliel's school or in the schools of Tarsus. It was when he was in the desert after he became a Christian in Damascus and then back in Tarsus. For 14 years, God renewed his mind. It was just him and the Lord. And I'm sure the Lord took him through the entire Old Testament and said, you know what, Paul? That speaks of Jesus Christ. That speaks of Jesus and so everywhere where law touched him before, grace began to touch him in those 14 years. And his mind was renewed. That was his greatest learning. And you guys can have that same learning too. Every morning, every evening, when you get with the Lord and you read your Bible and you get with him and he begins to transform you, you have the greatest teacher in the universe, the Holy Spirit, teaching you about the greatest person in the world, Jesus Christ. So he says, look, I'm not untrained in knowledge, but we've been thoroughly manifested um, among you in all things. In other words, you know all this. I told it to you before. And then he says, did I commit sin in humbling myself that I might be exalted? Uh, sorry, that you might be exalted because I preached the gospel of God to you free of charge? I robbed other churches, taking wages from them to minister to you. Now, he's speaking in figurative language. He didn't go around ripping off churches, you know, stealing out of the offering plate. Um, by the way, you, you know the, the writer Mark Twain. Well, Mark Twain didn't like churches and, and church folk too much. And he said every time he went to church, it made him feel bad. And so one time when the offering plate was going around, he actually lifted a few uh, dollar bills out of the offering plate to take for himself when he was a kid. Uh, that wasn't what Paul was doing in these, 
these places, but he was receiving income from them, supported by them. He says, and when I was present with you and in need, I was a burden to no one. For what I lacked, the brethren who came from Macedonia supplied. And in everything, I kept myself from being burdensome to you, and so I will keep myself. As the truth of Christ is in me, no one shall stop me from this boasting in the regions of Achaia. Now, the regions of Achaia is where Corinth was. So, the super apostles thought that their authority was proven by the amount of money that they could receive by speaking there. And so Paul, he says, I received missionary support from other churches. Paul was also a tent maker, you may know. And so he had a trade in which he supported himself financially. And he says, even when I was in need, I didn't let you know. I, I received help from the Macedonians. Now, would you turn over with me a few books to the right? And I want you to see where this help came from. Philippians chapter 4. Philippians 4 verse 10. He says, But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, that now at last your care for me has flourished again, though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. Now he's speaking of this gift. They helped him. Philippi was in Macedonia. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. abound. Everywhere and in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now that is a very famous passage, isn't it? We quote that a lot. You know, I'm weak, but I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And that is true, and we can apply it in many ways. But did you notice the context in which he actually gives it? He's talking about when we're needy, or when he was needy, as a Christian, he needed money. But he says, you know what? I've learned to be content. Whether I have a lot or whether I have a little, I have learned to be content with what God gives me. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That's where that comes from. Now you Philippians, sorry, in verse 14, nevertheless, you have done well that you shared in my distress. Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving but you only. For even in Thessalonica, you sent aid once and again for my necessities. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. I so like that verse. Because this takes the pressure off of any preacher who is teaching people the blessing of giving financially to the work of the ministry. So, you know, it could be sort of self-serving for me to talk to you about financial giving. But actually, Paul says, no, I'm not seeking it for myself. I'm seeking the fruit that abounds to your account. So that when you stand before God and you're there to receive your reward, he says, well done, good and faithful servant. You have given to the work of the ministry and now you're going to be rewarded for it. That's what he was seeking. He says, Indeed, I have all and abound. I am full, having received from Epaphroditus the things sent from you, a sweet-smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Now to, to our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. So as the Philippians were giving to Paul and helping him, he says, you know what? As you're giving out, God's going to give to you. Guaranteed. He gives seed to the sower. So, they were the ones that he basically robbed, quote unquote, to get support from. And they helped him out when he was in need. Now look with me in verse 11. Back in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 
Why? Because I do not love you? God knows. But what I do, I will also continue to do, that I may cut off the opportunity from those who desire an opportunity to be regarded just as we are in the things of which they boast. Paul knew that the false teachers were greedy for money. They weren't going to stoop to do it for free. And so Paul says, that's where I've got them. Because I'm going to do it for free. So no one can take this boast away from me. I am ministering for free. And they can't say that. Now you think that I don't love you. God knows I love you. You think that I'm not an apostle or they're telling you that I'm not. God has called me an apostle. And I'm doing it for free. Now Paul... We don't have time to look at it today, but if you look back in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, Paul says in that chapter, I have the right to receive an income as an apostle, but I have not used that right, lest anyone can take this boast away from me. He wouldn't even take the right that he had as an apostle to be supported. He did it for free because he loved them so dearly, he wanted them to know the Lord. Well, look in verse 13. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness, whose end will be according to their works. Three times in those three verses, you see the word transform, transforms, or transforming. And it means to disguise yourself or to masquerade as someone else. To pretend. He said that Satan is a master deceiver. He's a transformer. He transforms himself into an angel of light. Jesus said that he is a liar and the father of lies. Lies originate with the enemy. He disguises himself as an angel of light, even though he is the prince of darkness. Now, he is not like the Halloween devil. You see these kids walking around at Halloween. Little red suit, horns, pitchfork, tail. That's not the way that the devil looks. The word Lucifer actually means light bearer or day star. In fact, if you read through those passages, speak about Lucifer before the fall in Isaiah 14 in Ezekiel 28, it tells us some things about him. He was beautiful. He was the worship leader of heaven. And because of his beauty and because of his power and because of his position, he wanted to be worshipped himself. And he was cast out of heaven. And so now he's got access to the throne of God. We read in Job chapter 1, he goes and presents himself before God, but he can no longer have his abode there. He can no longer stay there permanently. He's cast down, and eventually he will be cast into the lake of fire. That's his eventual doom. But he's a light bearer. And so Paul says, well, it's no surprise if his ministers come disguised as real ministers. So you get a knock on your door. You open it up, and there are two people there, finely dressed in suits. They have name tags on them. Elder Jones and Elder Smith. Hi, we're from the Church of Latter-day Saints up the street. Perhaps you've seen our building, finely manicured lawns. Oh, yeah, we've seen that. What's that all about? Well, we want to talk to you about Jesus, our Savior, and about God, our Father. Could we have a few minutes to talk to you? And they're from the Mormon church, and they're giving you another Jesus, and yet they appear to be ministers of righteousness. You get another knock. You open the door up. There are two people with darker suits, with briefcases. They hand you an Awake magazine. 
and they're from the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society. They're from the Jehovah's Witnesses. And they want to talk to you about Jesus. They want to talk to you about God the Father. And yet they're pouring different meanings into those words. Their Jesus is not the Jesus of the Bible, but he's the Michael the Archangel, the first created being of God. And their system of salvation is not by faith, but it's by works, and they're going to put you in bondage. It's not a surprise if his ministers come disguised as ministers of righteousness. If they're leading you to another Jesus, they're not from God. If they're giving you another gospel, a gospel of works, they're not from God. Well, you know, Jesus did speak about this. And I want you, as we close, to turn with me to Matthew chapter 7. We're going to read what he says about these. Matthew 7, verse 15. He says, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, and every bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits, you will know them. How do you detect a false prophet, a false teacher, a cultist? Well, two ways. Number one, by their fruits. So, the fruit is what their lives produce. Um, Lisa, when she went up to the women's ministry in North Yorkshire a few, well, it was about a month ago now, she met a woman there who was a former Jehovah's Witness. <laughs> and she was telling her how she had come out of that organization. And it was because her daughter had started to date a man who wasn't a Jehovah's Witness, and the Jehovah's Witnesses shunned her. Now, in that organization, if you're shunned, you lose all of your friends. In fact, you lose your family. She was living in the home, and her brother wouldn't even talk to her. So she's about 16, 17 years old. So that started to trip something in this woman's mind. That's not very loving. And God says that we're supposed to love one another. Well, sadly, her daughter was raped. And the Jehovah's Witnesses continued to shun her. And this just blew her mind. In fact, they were starting to say that there was something wrong with her and her husband because of this situation. It was so unloving that it caused them to question what was going on. They saw the fruit. The ultimate fruit of being a Christian is love manifested in joy and peace and long-suffering and kindness and goodness, faithfulness and self-control. But love, it's the greatest fruit of being a Christian. And they, they thought, there's no love here. You'll know them, Jesus said, by their fruits. You know how else you're gonna know a false teacher? By their food. What do wolves eat? They eat sheep. So wolves come into your church and they're picking off sheep, especially little lambs, the young ones. So you watch on Christian television, quote unquote Christian television, and you see some of these guys. I'll name one of them because he's a really famous false teacher, Benny Hinn. Look at him. The guy is a greed monster. I mean, he just wants money. And he uses Christianity to get money. And there are lots of these guys on there, you know. Well, they're drawing sheep away. They're feeding on the sheep. They're not feeding the sheep. They're feeding on them. They're eating sheep. They're ravenous wolves. So God has set up pastors and under shepherds in the church to look out for these guys. You're to look out for them too. You see people coming in. They're trying to pick off people. Hey, that's not quite right. Hey, Doug, hey, Tommy, hey, hey, James, there's something going on with that guy. They're ravenous wolves. And notice what he says. Whose end will be according to their works. 
they're going to get what they deserve. On the day of judgment, if they haven't repented and turned to Christ, God's going to punish them. Now, I've only got a couple minutes. I want to say something as we just look here about Satan transforming himself into an angel of light. There are things called after-death experiences that people have sometimes. And there are movies and books written about these things. And when I hear these things, frankly, I'm very dubious. Because how do we know what actually takes place after someone dies? Well, we know it because of what Scripture says. Jesus Christ is the one who ascended from heaven to tell us what heaven is like. He's gone back to heaven. In every other thing that people say about heaven, we have to filter through what we know about heaven from the scriptures. So, recently there was a movie that came out called Heaven is for Real. It was, by, it was about a, a boy named Colton Burpo, who when he died in hospital, he went and, quote, saw Jesus, who apparently looked like an angel, but not quite. He saw his granddad. He saw a dead sister that his parents, I mean, she had a mis- his mother had a miscarriage, and, and he apparently saw his sister, even though they'd never told him about it. He saw the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit, in his estimation, was blue. How do we know that these things are true? I mean, they're making millions and millions of pounds at the box office. Well, we're going to read when we get to chapter 12 about Paul's, uh, when he had a vision of heaven, and he said, it's not lawful for me to utter what I saw there. I cannot tell you what I saw there. It was so beyond this world that if I tried to explain it to you, I couldn't. Paul, we know, was a writer of Holy Scripture, and he says, I can't even tell you what I saw. So there are lots of these kinds of after-death experiences that people claim to have, but quite often they all come to the same conclusion, and that is this. It's a different Jesus. It's a different spirit. It's a different gospel. I'll give you an example. There was a book that came out a number of years ago called Embraced by the Light by a woman named Betty Eady. She had an after-death experience, and this is what she said. She said, she met Jesus, who showed her in the spirit world that we were with God in the beginning and that we helped him create the earth, that sin is not our true nature, that we are inherently divine, that we are all God's children, and that we are here on earth to learn the lessons we need for our own spiritual evolution. Our key lesson is to remember our divinity and return to heaven. She embraces the idea that all religions and faith are equal in God's sight and that they are essential in our development. Likewise, spirits from the other side will also help us learn the lessons of life and aid in our progress. That death is a spiritual rebirth as we simply make a transition to another state of being and there will be no judgment day and we will judge ourselves regarding our spiritual evolution. Come to find out that she not only was a standing member of the Mormon church when she wrote this, but she was also involved with the New Age. Surprise, surprise. How do we know what's true? Well, we know it from the Bible and we can trust the Bible. So I would say, Satan can transform himself into an angel of light. So when these people go to that place, you know, and after that experience, and they see this light, I wonder what light they're seeing. How do we know? Well, we know it by the fruit of their lives. When we know it from what the scriptures have said. As we close, if you're not a Christian here, I want to challenge you with something. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. There's one way to God, according to Jesus Christ, and he proved that by rising from the dead. And if you put your faith and trust in what Jesus did for you on that cross and his resurrection, you will be saved. 
The Bible says you've got to do two things. You've got to turn, that means to repent, turn to God, and put your faith and trust in Christ, and Jesus will save you. So as Rich begins to play, I'm going to ask you to, to pray a prayer after me and receive him into your heart. Okay? Thank you, Rich. So if that's you, I'd like you to pray this prayer. Say, Jesus, I believe that I'm a sinner. I, I know that I've done wrong, and I'm sorry. I turn to you now. I believe that, Jesus, you died for me on the cross. I believe that you rose again the third day, and I put my faith and trust in you to save me from my sins. Come into my life and save me, Lord. Help me live for you by the power of your Holy Spirit from this day forward. In Jesus' name.